Welcome back, Billiken fans. It's Zach Miller and Peter Hale. This is the Midtown Madness podcast. Before we get going, thank you so much for listening. And if you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button as well as the bell down below. Uh, and you'll get notified whenever a new episode drops. Uh, this episode and the whole season of Midtown Madness podcast is brought to you by Two Men in a Garden. Whether you like it mild or hot, chunky or cantina style, people over two men have you covered. Uh, I picked up a jar at the store today to to munch on uh, during the women's A10 championship, Billikens Minute Women. Uh, it was wonderful as per usual. Uh, you can get out there many products at any local grocery store here in St. Louis or online at twomenandagarden.com. They're on Instagram and Twitter at Two Men Salsa. Pete, I, I truly, I truly have, I, I don't know what the hell happened today. <laughs> Still processing, huh? Or just, uh, just overwhelmed, like in a daze. It's, I, I don't know if my brain has like wrapped around the fact that like they are in the NCAA tournament. Yeah. Uh, because it's never happened. And I, I mean, even when the men won, the or the men got in 11 2011 12 season mm-hmm. i had i i knew that they had they had made the tournament before like i may not have fully grasped the concept when i was in like second grade sure um i don't i think that was i think that was around then but i just i, I still don't i don't think it's hit me yet that the billiken women are headed to the ncaa tournament for the first time in program history for the first time I, it really is incredible it's one of those things that i don't think even in my time there i just never realized i like i, I like it's this thing that i knew but it never really sank in until later like wow we've never made one like the women they've never made one and not not only have they never made the ncaa tournament they have they had never been to a final in a conference tournament now is that I I, I, know, I I think I could confidently say yeah I was gonna say because I I know it's true in the Atlantic Ten and I'm pretty positive they never made one in Conference would, USA I, I would uh, I would bet a lot of money on it I, maybe a, no it would have to be early on in a different be pre Conference USA yeah but I but look I've looked at the record book and I I don't. Somebody tell us if we're wrong, but I, I certainly don't think that they were ever uh, in position to make it to a conference final back in those days. And I didn't think they were this year. No, nobody did. I mean, this team, we have to remind people, picked to finish 12th in conference. 12th. Like you, UMass and Rhode Island were by far the toast of this league. For a while, both flirting with kind of at-large bids. Um, SLU was not even supposed to be in the picture. Uh, this, is, this is an incredible, incredible performance. This is Fordham winning in Brooklyn, which is what's going to happen. <laughs> um, you're you're probably right about that. No, I, I think you know what, and and you can you can confirm this. I knew they were going to win the tournament. <laughs> so I I don't know how many times in our various text messages. You in either one on one with me or in groups or like other people in groups are like they're gonna mess around and win this thing, aren't they? Like they're like they're gonna go to Brooklyn and win this. And there was no doubt that they were the hottest team in conference, right? Delaware. Sorry, what did I say? Brooklyn. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Save Wil- that for next weekend. That's right, Wilmington, Delaware. Um, but uh, which, by the way, looks like a really cool venue. Mm-hmm. Um, wish wish I could have made it. They out had there, salsa. But- that's all that matters. I know it's not two men though, <laughs> but um, but but yeah, we we there was kind of that vibe that like, look, I, I I didn't get my hopes up. Like I wasn't like banking on it. I wasn't counting on it. Like they've already overachieved so much because of the way that they finished the season. That I thought, um, all all I know is that nobody in this league wants to play them. Mm-hmm. Like like you you look at the bracket and they're the three seed and. See, St. Joe's buried them earlier this season. And now St. Joe's had to play them 42 minutes from their campus, right? And then you have to look at Rhode Island, who's on the same side of the bracket. Like, man, I really wish <laughs> SLU was a four and not the three. 
you know, and UMass going, I'm glad they're on the other side of the bracket. Cause like UMass and Rhode Island knew for a long time, they're going to be on opposite sides of the bracket. Um, I don't know if they really conceived of anyone else as a real threat until slew at the end. Um, and so they were it, clowning on people like leading up to this tournament, they were clowning on teams. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, for sure. So, so it just that like slew had that kind of, in addition to all that momentum, they had that kind of like, they're a scary team right now. And, and it felt like they had that advantage of everyone else is probably more scared of us than we are of them. Right. Like, yeah. I think that's kind of the mindset that they had. I mean, and, and one of the other, and I think, the, uh, think about coach Tillett's whole, um, she doesn't like survive in advance. She likes yeah. attack in advance. And I kind of like that. Like, I don't, I don't know if that's the perfect word for it. Attack in advance. I haven't thought of anything better. But what I like about it is that is survive is such a passive verb, right? Like survive is like, it, it, I got lucky, you know, I just happened to survive. Like I'm a product of circumstance where attack, it like gives you the agency it, and uh, it turns it into a more active uh, verb that I, I, I like that mindset and, and man, oh man, did they, uh, did they apply that to their play? Yeah. I think, you know, you, you said you're not, you weren't going to get your hopes up and, and I almost think that like my outlook on the tournament was quiet confidence in a lot of ways because sure. you watched this team you know beat Fordham beat uh what UMass in the final game uh they clowned on George Mason at uh whatever day uh, well uh, student day um they they just had all these games where they they played really, really well, and they were whipping the ball around, playing on a different level than the the you know top five teams in this conference. And you're like, I, I, I mean, this is this is the team. This isn't a fluke. This this is just this team is good now. Like they fight. They had a bunch of great pieces. And and one thing I didn't even think about is that like McMakin. Uh, and the rest of the the players that came over from Longwood, they did win a championship last year. So you again, that's that didn't even occur to me uh, until today. Uh, it's, so it, it, yeah, it's one of those things I kind of had in the back of my mind. But like, there's there's still the element of they won the Big South tournament, right? Like the the A10 different. Like there's no UMass or Rhode Island in, in the Big South. So, so that's the thing that I always had there is like, okay, I, I just think it's a little bit different level. And, um, you know, how, how does that translate? But you're right. I mean, they, they have been through it. They know the mindset. So let me, let me kind of, I, this just occurred to me again, is basically what Rebecca Tillett did. And, and she, to her credit and some to her, you know, some can be critical about it is when we started this season, uh, you looked at this roster and you and I did because we watched last year sure. and we watched the players that are staying around. And we said, look, like you're not playing uh, Martinez enough. You're not playing Julian Martinez enough. And yeah, um, I think to credit or, you know, Tillett was kind of trying to use the players she knew better. Uh, in the outset, and I don't blame her for that at all. Uh, I certainly give her credit for changing her mindset uh, midseason, or I guess you know, pick learning and and being able to make the the necessary adjustments. But she took basically the stars of um, Lisa Stone's roster, minus Kaija Harbison. Uh, and she brought in role players, which were stars on Longwood. Mm -hmm. So essentially what you're doing is bringing in really good role players, you know, like a, like a Ken Calhoun, uh, a, um, you know, I, I guess you could throw in McMakin as a role player, but like, I, I mean, she is kind of a role player. She gets buckets. That's kind of her deal. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, but no, it's just, it's interesting to me that this worked. Like this was the thing I yeah. wondered and to, and I don't think I anticipated how great Julia Martinez, Brooke Flowers and Peyton Kennedy would be for this team. Yeah. I think that that's, that's all absolutely true. Um, I, I, I just, uh, I, I mean, there were, there were a lot of reasons to sort of be skeptical, you know, coming in. 
Um, and we we asked her those questions too, right? Like you're you're kind of merging two two groups of players, and and how's that going to work? Especially when you throw in a few other transfers and freshmen. Um, you know, are those players going to level up from the from the Big South to the A10? Um, is this non conference schedule too hard? I mean, don't don't forget that they won. I think it was did they go four and eleven or five and eleven in non conference play? Um, they, they played a full non-conference slate and they played some really tough teams in that, in that, um, uh, in that stretch. And then you, you, um, you brought it up already that it, it did take her a long time to kind of settle into what her rotation was going to be. She, she threw a, there were a lot of different looks that she threw on the floor early on, but now you see like in this conference tournament, it was basically the same five players who were dominating those minutes. Um, so she's really settled into what that core is. And, uh, and, and wow, are they, are they clicking at the right time? I mean, like, it's not just that she realized, yeah, Martinez has to be the one to be playing more. And like, like she, she tweaked some things here and there. She's also managed to, to get the most out of all of these players, right? Like Brooke Flowers was not an offensive threat at all. Like even for part of this season. And she looked like not, not really a great rebound. I mean, she had the numbers, but she kind of looked a little outmatched at times on the boards. She's playing by far the best basketball of her career in these last, I'll call it 15 games or so. She has completely transformed her offensive game. And her body language, her energy on the floor is totally different. One of the things about her throughout her career is she's always been kind of... Um, she she just hasn't had that killer instinct. And like now we've seen her like in this conference tournament shouting after like big plays, after and ones, uh getting teed up by a ref <laughs> in, in one game. I mean, like for arguing, it's it's a side of her, it's more emotion than we've ever seen before. Um, so so Tillett has not just like found the rotation that works, the 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 combinations, the players, the plays that work. Um, she's getting the most out of each individual player, and you can see that. Yeah, I mean, I don't, it's so, it, this is so crazy. Um, I, I, I had a, I had a plan, uh, you know, going into this weekend about how this episode was going to go and, uh, <laughs> uh, Tilla don't give a shit about my plans. No, you got to throw it out the window. Uh, let's, you know what, we have all these recaps in and really, I think most people only care about the final. Uh, but no, I mean like, so I definitely want to recap the tournament. Yeah, uh, but we so can, let's let's run down. Uh, we, yeah, we can go through the other ones a little quickly and get and kind of dig into the final. Yeah, let's um, kind of run down the uh, the kind of the recap uh, leading into uh, the Billikens' first game in the quarterfinals. Yeah, it was a pretty chalky tournament, right? I mean, the first two days, the only upsets you had were nine seed George Mason over eight seed LaSalle, if you even want to call that an upset. And then in the quarterfinals, you had five seed Richmond over four seed Fordham. Um, but that was about it. UMass handled Richmond on the other side of the semifinals, 80 to 60 in the end. Um, that one was close in the first half, but then they ran away with it. Um, and that brought us to the final um, on that side, UMass. Um, so to kind of backtrack and show how SLU got there, um, Zach, they open up against six seed St. Joe's in the quarterfinals. And I kind of hated this draw. I mean, we, we already said St. Joe smacked them earlier this season up on Hawk Hill. And then this, this gym, um, Chase Fieldhouse in Wilmington, Delaware is only 42 minutes away from where St. Joe's plays. And that kind of felt like, uh, I mean, as, as well as they're playing, I don't know if you could get a worse draw in the, in the quarterfinals than that. No, I, you know what I like, I honestly didn't hate it. Um, just because I saw, I like the way they were playing is just, it was ridiculous. They were, right. I mean, they looked like the best team in the A-10, right? I, I, I they were, look, this, sure. this was, I mean, so going in, I just felt like it was a brand new season. I know that's cliche as hell, but like when you play the way they were playing leading in this tournament, I really didn't care what the bracket was. I just wanted to see them go at it because. I, I just for whatever reason, man, this team, uh, uh, this team has found a a uh, an insane amount of confidence in its talent, yeah. in its coach to to prepare them, and I, I mean, I don't. Uh, wow, wow, Pete. Well, and they ended up with basically the hardest road possible, right? Because you're, you're facing a six seed that that was the closest geographic team to the the conference tournament 
who had beaten you earlier in the season. And then you have to play the two and the one on the next two days. So not, not only did they win the thing, they, they, they had the hardest possible draw um, on, on, on each, on each day, but you know, so St. Joe's, they handle 11 seed Davidson pretty comfortably the day before to get to this game, you know, Slew had the double buy with three seed and it was a close game for a while. You know, they traded runs in the first half, 17, 17 after one, nobody could score in the second and St. Joe's was up two at halftime. Things are tight still in the third. And then Slew all of a sudden rips off a 12, one run to finish the quarter. And then they hold St. Joe's to just seven in the fourth um, to put it away. I think they only allowed 16 points in the second half, um, which is just incredible. Um, Kyla McMakin in this one starts one of nine from the field and then makes five of her last nine shots to finish with 19. Brooke Flowers, this was the game where she got teed up for being a little too emotional, but, uh, you know, with a ref on one call, but she finishes with 12 and 15 and three blocks. Uh, played really well. And then Martinez in this one, Zach, this was kind of odd. She picks up three fouls in the first half in just six minutes to scare us all. Plays all 10 minutes in the third quarter and then, you know, winds up with five steals in the game. Her presence in the third quarter is really what changed things. You know, that that first half, you got to it's it's a two point game slews down. But Julia Martinez is not out there for 14 of those 20 minutes. And I think that's a huge difference. She was truly unreal in this tournament defensively. I, I don't know how uh, she goes about her job without following like this every game, but yeah, uh, it, it's, it's absolutely impressive. Um, talk about Ken Calhoun. She was uh, just like uh, this. This woman has the fastest hands I've ever seen in my life. She really does. You know, she's, she's an interesting player because she has a really low center of gravity. She's a short player. But she kind of reminds me you if you remember Mateen Cleaves. He may be you were pretty pretty young. I, he, I remember Mateen Mateen Cleaves was on the team that came through St. Louis, wasn't it? For the final four. I believe um well, no. Um by the time that final four it was in, in was that, St. Louis no, was oh five. So he yeah. was gone by then. Okay. But they they definitely had come through St. Louis and regionals and stuff before, but um so yeah, he was he played in you know early aughts in Michigan State, but he was he's a shorter guy. But he he had like kind of short legs and a long torso, right? And it it, it almost felt like it kind of gave him this, uh, like a like a his different build gave him a different center of gravity. It gave him some more burst offensively, but it, um, defensively it was almost like he he was at a different level than other players, right? And and could create steals. And Ken Calhoun reminds me of that so much, like just in like her stance, her physicality. It's kind of a weird comp, but I always think of that when I watch her. And in this game. She winds up with eight points, but six steals, you know, doing her best. Um, Julia Martinez's impression, basically, uh, it, just just deflecting everything. I get up in arms when they call her for a reach in. Oh, I'm like, no, that's bullshit. Yeah, there's no way. No, um, no. Yeah, her her hands are incredible, though. Uh, poor shooting game for the Bills in this one, uh, but they forced a ton of turnovers and they kept. Uh, they kept, uh, they took care of the ball. They did only 37% from the field for slew 20 from three, but St. Joe's went over 13 from three. So you can get away with a poor shooting night. If you, if you hold them to, um, to a worse one and then slew, as always, they shot well from the, uh, from the stripe 86%. So that's huge forced 20 turnovers only committed 10. And that was their lowest total this season. Um, and when you go plus four and rebounding on top of that, it amounts to 11 extra field goal attempts. And, and when we say force turnovers here, you know, talking about Calhoun and Martinez, they truly did force turnovers. That was 14 total steals in this game. Um, Martinez and Calhoun's hands were everywhere. St. Joe's less athletic team than SLU, and it showed in this one. They got really frustrated. It was uh, just the, the defense was absolutely relentless. It, it really was. And I uh, I forgot that I watched this game and I feel really bad about that. Three and three days is a lot, especially when you have kind of a, a memory erasing uh, event like today, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, but, no, but look, Dayton too. I mean, the end of that Dayton game made me forget about the women's. Like I watched the end of the women's game, but like I, the Dayton game kind of, preempted it in my brain i think oh, got it yeah yeah for sure yeah but hey look like slew slew can get into trouble when they shoot like this but 
the the defense was so aggressive it just gave them a a, a shot I mean their their effort on both ends was there um, but I think defense was really the story on this one uh, the semifinal on Saturday the fourth 59-56 win versus two seed Rhode Island the Billikens had a bit of an issue in this one uh, and it's in the notes but it would be almost a precursor to what almost was the downfall again on Sunday. Yeah, I mean, it, it really came down to rebounding, mm-hmm. right? I mean, defensive rebounding. They 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 let uh, Rhode Island back into it on this yes. one because because like when you look at this, Slew goes up in a way that none of us saw coming. Twenty one six after the first quarter, forty one twenty four at halftime. I I thought it was twenty, but they actually got up to twenty one at one point because I remember it being twenty six six and twenty nine nine. Um, but that just shows you like what they were doing um, in the first half of this one, but it really was a tale of two halves. Um, SLU only scored nine points in each of the third and fourth quarters. Um, you know, their, their shooting kind of dried up. And and like you said, the rebounding was a real problem. They let Rhode Island get to within one and somehow escape with the win. Uh, I don't quite know how, but when, when you look at this last sequence here, um, what, I mean, Rhode Island had every opportunity to win it, but but Zach, the thing that stands out to me here is they didn't hit a field goal for, for the last four minutes of this game. They missed their last seven shots, so every point down the stretch comes from the line. Say what you will about calls or how anything broke in this one, but Rhode Island has nobody to blame but themselves. Like Slew gave them every chance to win this down the stretch, and uh, they just couldn't hit a shot. Yeah, and this was the game I think where like I, I the the Billiken defense just hit another level, especially on that run. Uh, I and if the Billikens rebound, like you know we talk about, I, I mean this is a thirty point win. Oh my God! Yeah, I mean they, Brody got so many um, extra chances, um, extra possessions out of that. I mean there there were trips where they got three, four looks at the basket, and he, there was one where. They came up empty on four tries, but it was still like that. That just can't happen. You you just can't, you just can't do that. A little um, controversy though with the uh, the foul calls in this one, uh, dude. I'm telling you, like, if you call that a flagrant, there you're that's that's terrible. And uh, I think, pay, yeah, pay, I think that's kind of what the refs decided to. I mean, but but man, uh, I think she got away with one. Oh, I, I mean, in the in a general run of play, she definitely got away with something. But like, I I will say like, she was high, but the player was low. She also kept her arm tucked into her side. She didn't raise her elbows. It was more of a bicep, you know. Yeah, it was it was by bi- and and do like. Uh, they were way too close to her. Come on, they. I mean, she was being fouled anyway um that, that's what kind of surprised me is i thought they were going to give rhode island the quicker whistle like but when the defender so so it was an inbound play right peyton kennedy gets the ball she's got it up kind of at her chin level has her elbows high turns and 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 kind of looks like she hits um the incoming defender in the jaw but like both of these defenders are rushing in basically playing the steal right like trying to get the steal but they're willing to take the foul and I thought the refs were going to give a quick enough whistle to Rhode Island to where it wouldn't have been an issue. But Kennedy oh, throwing that elbow like she that, got, I mean, she did it kind of pissed too. She had a look on her face. Yeah. Like she was very annoyed. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, I don't think that helped things, but they wind up just calling it a regular foul, not a, not a flagrant. And uh, they could have changed the game. Very well. Errors of omission rather than commission, Peter. Um, Mm -hmm. Tough night for McMakin, 317. uh, One of eight from three, four turnovers, seven points in 35 minutes. Uh, Flowers and Martinez. Yeah. Yeah, again, 12 and 14 with three blocks for Flowers. um, Broke the single season rebounding record in this game. Martinez, 15 points, nine rebounds, eight assists. A little preview of what she was going to do the next day. Three steals. Um, she did wind up with five turnovers and a few of those about gave me a heart attack. Um, but she also was making plays in this game late in the second half when no one else was making plays. A near and, quad nickel for her in this. One. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, just, just, I mean, yeah, we talked about the rebounding and 
Uh, Rhode Island ended up with 10 offensive rebounds in the first, nine in the second. Their pressure got to slew at times, especially in the second half. Slew's shooting went from 50% in the third to 29% in the second. Uh, Peyton Kennedy, all of her points were in the first half. So there's so many things to clean up, you know, like the the, the rebounding, the decision-making, the press break. Um, and it's amazing to win a game against one of these top two teams when you play this sloppy, but they just find a way every time. They just find a way. Uh, speaking of finding a way, we get to the championship game and uh, what an afternoon it was for Billiken fans. 91-85 win in OT versus number one seed UMass in the finals on Sunday the 5th. Billikens, as we stated before, earned their first ever NCAA tournament appearance in women's basketball. Wow. <laughs> well said, Zach. Well said. I think we can move on after that. Yeah. Um, I think uh, I think it's safe to say the Coach Tillett experiment is ahead of schedule. Um, I don't think anybody saw this coming this year. I, I'm so, so happy for the players who stuck around like Brooke Flowers and Julia Martinez and, and, you know, players who could have transferred and, um, and they're now getting a taste of the NCAA tournament. And there um, are players who transferred, huh? I, the, one of the first people I thought about was Kaja Harbison, especially mm -hmm. after she made the comment, like when she got to, was it a thousand points or whatever yeah. for her career and said, I can't, I would never have done it anywhere else, but Vanderbilt. And now I'm thinking like, Kind of would have been interesting to have you around this season. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I, uh, I don't even know, like, what, like, I mean, Kennedy Calhoun? Like, I, I, I mean, this team, like. Uh, well, I, I think, um, I think Camry Clegg was probably the last, um, the last, except for the transfer from Chicago State. That's right. Uh, the big Camry, Cl uh, whose name, I, sorry. I, I, I dare. Yeah, I can never, I can never say. It right. I can't either. But I think Camry Clegg from St. John's was one of the later transfers, so I'm guessing that guard would have probably been the one to not, uh, to to not come in. But um, but regardless, Harbison left, and now she misses out on a on a tournament appearance at SLU. Uh, this was less than two weeks after upsetting UMass 77-75 in St. Louis. Uh, Peter was tied after one, tied at halftime. Uh, and led slew led by three after three and then tied at the end of I mean, this game was an instant classic from it, it, tip off. Yeah, it was. It was a coin flip throughout. I mean, like neither of any time you thought like, okay, they're they're kind of stringing a few plays together here. There's a couple stops, there's a couple scores. The other team always had an answer, right? Like no, no team could put the other one at at arm's distance, really. I mean, this this was really it was a coin flip game the entire time. Although I will see when Sam Breen hit that three to put UMass up uh, with just over two minutes. I, I, that's when I kind of thought like, okay, I, I, I feel like the momentum has swung. I don't know. Like, yes, it's one point and yeah, there are two minutes and a lot can happen, but I, I felt like uh, I think that's where the, the higher seed, um, you know, asserts themselves and puts it away, but I was happy to be wrong. Yeah, I mean, it, it did feel like the Billikens were in control of that game from the tip. Like, it was not necessarily, I guess, for the most part, maybe in the first five minutes, but after about the first five minutes, it really was the Billikens extending the lead and UMass clawing back. And then the Billikens would, I mean, it would get to maybe two or one, and then the Billikens would extend it back to six or seven. Uh, I thought... I I thought once the Billikens, you know, got out and got to about a three point lead at, at the first the first time, I I I thought they had it kind of in their bet. It was their game to lose at that point. They just had to continue to perform. Right, right. I, I mean, I that I think that's right. Um, I was trying to find the stat that showed how long each team led, but I, I don't have that in the final box score. We know there were nine. Uh, lead changes 14 times that they were tied <laughs> to give you an idea of just how tight this one was. Uh, but yeah, pretty incredible. I don't, I, I can't tell how much of it actually slew led, but it, it does feel like they did lead from more of this one. But why don't we walk through the kind of uh, the end of this one, right? Like, um, I, I gotta be honest, 
it, I am so glad I did not tweet right away because I would have to be doing some apologizing to <laughs> Kyla McMakin right now. Yeah, because uh, what happened here is um, she so she banks in a jumper to take back the lead um, after that Sam Breen three pointer, mm-hmm. and um, and then Flowers followed it up with a layup right at the buzzer of the the, the shot clock. So slews up with uh, they're up three with eleven seconds left, right, and then um, inexplicably, you know, um, McMakin comes in late on a Sydney Taylor three point attempt, and kind of she goes up, doesn't necessarily hit her until she's on the way down. And as soon as she, you know, their their bodies make any contact at all, Taylor was happy to flop to the floor. Um, I don't think her three pointer was anywhere near target, um, even before that. Um, but but uh, but yeah, so she winds up with three free throws with Slew up three, and now there's what eight point eight seconds left on the clock. Um, she winds up making two of them, and they need to foul twice to put Slew on the line. Then McMakin makes both of those. And um, of course, Taylor gets the ball back again and hits the buzzer beating three. Um, just unbelievable. And 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 yet again, Zach, that's another that's another one where I'm like, you know, we both had some choice words. I know. Um I was I was around my kids at the time <laughs> trying trying to say uh the right ones, but uh I, that's the second time where I felt like, okay, well, UMass has this now, you know, like, even though it's not over, over, I just kind of, you just kind of feel like, all right, well, that's it. That's, that's the dagger. And I was happy for a second time to be wrong about that. I think this team, this team's defensive identity, you know, we talked a lot on the men's side and I I hate to do this because I get really annoyed with the people that hop into the, to the women's threads on billikins.com you know afford this for that look at till like let till its accomplishment and this team's accomplishment stand on its own but you know we talked about how the defense would take or the billiken men's team would go as far as their defense will take them and i mean the 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 billiken women's defense is taking them to heights this program has never seen literally yeah, it's true. I mean, the, the the two games before this, I think, are even better examples. You know, they they held um, St. Joe's to forty four. They hold Rhode Island. You know, one of the the best again, one of the top two teams in the league by far to fifty six points. Uh, and you know, that's incredible to hold. You know, a hundred combined points coming into this game that you've allowed in this tournament so far. Um, and, and even though it winds up being 85 in this one, they just make those plays, right? They just frustrate players. I mean, one of the notes I have in this game is Sam Breen, who has won conference player of the year in the A-10, goes up against Brooke Flowers and looks so frustrated. That was one of the reasons Slew won that game against them 11 or 12 days ago is because Flowers just got to Breen. She like, like for whatever reason, she just takes her out of her game. And yeah, even though Breen finishes with 17 points in this one, she was clearly frustrated for so much of the first half. And then not to mention our guards, Calhoun's hands, Martinez just jumping in on everything. Um, they're a frustrating team to play against. I think that's kind of the the defensive identity. Yeah, you with St. Louis City playing their first game on Saturday night, uh, energy drink soccer. Uh, has been a term that has been floating around the metro area. Mm. Um, you know, I I I said during the game I thought this team reminded me of a counter pressing in soccer. Oh. Like yeah. you you see a missed shot, like VCU back in the day would refuse to press off a miss. Yeah. I mean, that not refuse, but they you know they I think later in Shaka Smart maybe post havoc. Uh, they, they press, you know, on the makes this team presses, you know, immediately on the rebound, uh, at least one person trying to disrupt, uh, it's, it's almost like, you know, you're, you're stopping transition by attacking them rather than getting players back on defense. You're disrupting the transition before they can even think about transition. Uh, it, it's a wild strategy and it's, it's, it, you've got the perfect players in, in Kennedy Calhoun and Julia Martinez. 
And I was just about to make that point is I wonder if this is a thing like, yes, Calhoun's probably going to be around a couple more years, but Martinez, you know, she went back. Well, I know for real, she, yeah. you've got the COVID bonus here, please come back. Um, but, uh, but, but she walked on senior day, right? Like, so, so I, I don't know what that meant. Like to me, that's a signal that, that she's not, but regardless, I'm, I'm wondering, is that something that's always going to be part of till it's, uh, you know, defensive identity with this team, or is, is she one of those coaches who just kind of finds what works for her personnel? Um, I guess we don't know the answer to that. The fact that it's only year one but um it's just it's it's incredible and it's what allows them zach they go down two early in overtime 79 77 with uh and then with with just over two minutes left to play um mcmakin hits a shot that that starts a 12-0 lead or a 12-0 run to put this one to bed like you're you're you know you're fretting you're looking at this going man i don't know if we're going to be able to pull this out umass is so juiced now after hitting that shot and then all of a sudden it's a double digit lead for SLU at the end of this. And you're just like, how did this happen? And it's, it's that relentless, relentless pursuit on, on defense. Um, and, and the confidence that they've had on offense lately. Yeah. I, you mentioned what happens after Julia and, and Brooke move on. And I really hope she can bring in players on that level. Uh, yeah. I think, I think going to the NCAA tournament like this, uh, you, you, you watching the players develop as uh, individuals and as a team has to be inspiring. Um, you know, it has to be uh, inspiring to potential recruits and also, you know, uh, a great thing for Rebecca Till to be like, look, like, look at, look at, look at the progress this team made in this amount of time. Imagine what you can do in four years. Uh, yeah, I think that's right. That's a good, that's a very good selling point. Really soon, we're going to get into three commitments that she's bringing in. But I think the answer right now is front court size is what oh, she's going oh, for. Gonna need it. Because like we we talked about, um, we, we it feels like Brooke, you know, great rebounder. Julia Martinez is an excellent rebounding guard, but they don't really rebound well outside of those two. Um, I think that the, her first item of business and recruiting is kind of to shore up front court. They've got legit size coming in um, and rebounding ability, not necessarily eye popping numbers um, offensively, but I think she's, she's bringing in the, the, the players to do that. So, you know, we'll see how that goes in this one though. I mean, you, you got to look at SLU. They take down the top two teams on back-to-back days and games that could have gone either way. So this gives them three of four wins against the top two teams in conference. Um, Five players, Zach, play over 40 minutes. McMakin, Martinez, Kennedy, Flowers, Calhoun. They all played 40-plus minutes in this game. And, um, man, do they deserve all the accolades possible for their effort. All five and double figures, too. Uh, I, I, I need to unload my, my Julia Martinez. Like, I tweeted out a little bit, like, like a – a preview of my actual thought on Julia Martinez as a player, but I swear to God, Julia Martinez, it, watching her play is like watching somebody that you gave a basketball that had never seen basketball before, that you gave a basketball and a basketball hoop and just said, here, practice getting the ball into the hoop. And they spent 10,000 hours doing that, never seeing basketball and they learned their own super awkward, but like efficient way to score. That's <laughs> Julia and, and dribble and all of this stuff. That's Julia Martinez to me. I've never like she finds new ways to spin the ball off the backboard that I didn't know existed. Mm. Yeah. It's in, like women's basketball in general is 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 a hot is very much adapted comparative to to men's especially in the form aspect i mean shooting is completely i mean the it's so crazy but she is just off the charts good at playing through contact uh i'm making pa- I, the passes she made today i uh she might be the best Billiken passer. I'm just saying. 
she made a pass to flowers yesterday that I, that was and late in the game too that i thought was so bold because flowers was closely guarded the defender was right there and martinez brought the ball over her head and just threw a rope to flowers and put it above her head right like taking yeah. advantage of brooks size at 65 and all, and flowers catches high and and finish i actually now that i'm thinking I, I she may have been fouled on the play but regardless flowers gets two points out of that you know like like the the fact that martinez has the confidence the guts to make that pass um flowers knows what to do with it she yeah i mean in, incredible in that regard but also like i think of martinez mostly kind of in terms of what she does between the free throw lines like like you're talking about her finishing and her passing ability and i'm thinking like what she does in the open court that is so unique um she plays at a completely different speed than everyone else absolutely fearless relentless and going to get the ball i mean like we talked about goodwin being such a unique player on the men's team and and that's kind of what she is on the on the on the women's side they completely different styles and and types of play and everything but um relentless pursuit of the ball at every you know juncture and then fearlessness when she has it in her hands one of the most bizarre plays I've ever seen on a basketball court in this game. Uh, Julia Martinez goes up to get a rebound, gets undercut, is being is being carried on another player's back, and still tries to shoot the ball. <laughs> like she was well, on her she was on her back for a second, a full second. Uh, yeah, and no foul was like, why didn't she get shots? Yeah, I mean, she probably thought at that like if at that point she's like, well, I'm being undercut. I'm just going to throw it up there, and 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 maybe I'll get an and one out of the thing. <laughs> it was so impressive. I everything she does on a basketball court is just is poetic, and I I mean the, her ability to just steal the ball off an outlet pass is ridiculous. Like so they said on the broadcast. By the way, that color commentator was freaking terrible that dude had no interest in being there he did he did no work pre pre-game he did not know a damn thing that was going on in that game i don't even know if he was watching whether he was i i have no idea but we're we're spoiled by colin surrey and yes, his we uh, are. Oh, by the way by the way go back i i cannot wait till he posts by the way jordan Nicer, you've got to overlap Colin's call at the end of the game with your with your highlights, please. I know it's going to be out by the time this drops. I'm begging you. Um, yeah, no. The the one thing they did say though was that uh, you're you're going out of pocket if you're throwing the ball anywhere near Julia Martinez on an outlet pass. Yeah, she's going to gobble that thing up. So she makes the all-tournament team along with Flowers and McMakin, but um, McMakin scores 27 today, Zach, and is named most outstanding player of the tournament. I think we're probably in agreement here that it's really Martinez's award um, or arguably Flowers. Yeah. I, I think, I mean, I think they all have a case, but they tend to give it to the scorer, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's unfortunate. Uh, yeah. McMakin just, you know, she was three of 17 the day before. Yeah. Um you know, one of nine in the first half the day before that. So she does wind up with the most points, but kind of like, uh, I don't know. I, I think, I think what's amazing though is Julia Martinez is probably happy to give that, that award up. Yeah. One less piece of hardware, but she did finish with the second triple double in program history, 17 points, 13 rebounds, 12 assists, four steals, a block and one turnover. That's always the stat category I worry about with her. Was there a partridge in a pear tree there too? <laughs> Two turtle doves and only one turnover. Um, uh, incredible though. Second triple double. Um, and I, and uh, you know, I, I, she like, she's been flirting with it all season long. She almost had one yesterday and then winds up getting it today. Of course, like when people listen to this, it's one day off and we're sorry, but we record on Sundays. You got to know that by now. Um, McMakin, by the way, I don't want to pass over the fact that she now set the, uh, single season scoring record with 591 points passing Teresa Lish. Um, that's so that's preposterous. I mean, ter like Teresa Lish was dirty, but 
I, I what I would have loved to see, and I, I'm this is not hard to look the up. Percentages, I'm sure yes. How many fewer shot attempts it took to re, Teresa Lish to have, you know, five hundred and eighty or whatever her number was. Um, so <laughs> I guarantee it was a lot less. Yeah, I mean, McMakin legit. I, I don't like. I, I thought she was phenomenal in this game for most of the game, but she damn near lost us the game on like four straight possessions. Um, uh, hey, you know what? Uh, I, I'm so proud of this damn team. Um, this was this was a, a brilliant surprise. Uh, yeah, on some level, was a brilliant surprise, right? Like I like I said, I thought they were g- gonna win this. I really did, and. Uh, but this whole season has been just a really nice surprise. Yeah, it it really has, and um, you know, just uh, what what can you say? I mean, they're they're seventeen and seventeen now. Um, wow. After after winning their last well eleven of their last twelve, um, I just there aren't enough superlatives that you can give these players, Rebecca Tillett, the job that they've done this season to defy our expectations completely, you know, like look, when we came into the season and, the, and they said slew's 12th, you and I kind of looked at that and said, it feels a little harsh. It feels a little low, but look, we've got a new coach. We've got a lot of new players. I think we could compete to be a top half team. Um, Colin, you know, when we had him on several weeks ago said we should get to 500 and they just kept going. Right. Like, like they not only, well, no, I think he said 500 altogether. Oh, you 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 didn't think he meant in conference? Because at the time I, we were, uh, we, were I, we were not even five hundred in conference yet. I, I mean, do Homie has had con- confidence in this team from, I mean, prior to Loyola. Like well, this winning the tournament was basically the only way we could get to five hundred, right? Because uh, like, yeah. I think we only lost one game after that conversation with him. And then uh, you would have had to win, even if you won out in the regular season, you would have had to win at least two in the tournament. So, uh, yeah. Where does this stand on a couple levels? Okay. Obviously, one of the greatest turnarounds in sports history within a season uh, would be the 2019, 1819 St. Louis Blues. Um, Going Mm. from now, you look at, uh, you know, a a champion that came out of nowhere. You've got your Leicester Cities. Uh, that I'm not going to compare to. That's a ridiculous comparison to yeah. make. <laughs> but where does this stand, I think, right now in the sports landscape, as in, like, just as an accomplishment to go from uh, the record they had, the loss to Loyola Chicago, looking absolutely like the worst team in the conference, uh, to what we watch today well the unfortunate thing is it's just not as high profile right as 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 the other local sports that they would get compared to i mean what was the rams record the the season before they won the super bowl like like they were supposed to be a bad team the year they won the super bowl right um so Uh, uh, weren't that was a great team but yeah, well, but I no, don't, okay, hold on. No, no, their, so, their quarter, their quarterback, yeah, went down, so, you know, yeah, like, the, so, like yeah. they weren't supposed to be they weren't that prior. Well, I mean, that was that was preseason game, the quarterback went down. So, I mean, once he went down, they just expected Kurt Warner to do nothing to just I, I, maybe right. hold them, above. but I mean, you, that team had like I, I don't even want to get into it. Yeah, yeah we, we don't have, I guess, but, but that team was really good. <laughs> Uh, but but my, think, my point is there just aren't as many eyeballs on this, this team, this, this sport, this product. Where, where does it stand in, pre- in like as an impressive feat? Like say all things being equal, not necessarily, we're not talking about uh, the, the eyeballs on it. Like where does this accomplishment fit? I, I think it's equal to the, to the Stanley cup run. Yeah. If I mean, not, if not more. The the only difference there is they they won a championship, but it but they it's look technically that was, I mean we did the same thing that was the next step for what that you know that's true too team needed to do right yes. like they had done everything but win a cup this team had never made a tournament like this is this is what the goal was and they hit it they had never done it before I mean to me that's just 
I don't know. I, I hate to even compare it to anything else. It's just like this is this is what the new standard is it, for the program. It, it, I mean, it's not even, but it's not like I'm not even talking about year to year. I'm literally talking like from when they played Loyola Chicago, they looked like they were dog shit. Yeah, to turn it around within this this span of one. Yeah, and, sure. And yeah. See, here's the here's the funny thing. So this is kind of a funny anecdote. I was at, I believe we played the Los Angeles Kings. And I mm-hmm. sat third row. It was the last game before Mike Yo was fired. I was at that game. It was the most horrendous sporting event I've ever seen up until that point. The game I watched, I was at the Loyola Chicago game, and it was the worst goddamn experience of my life at yeah. a sporting event, at a sporting event uh, that involved the sports. I've had some weird stuff happen at sporting events that were, ne- never mind. The sporting event caused me to have the worst time ever. <laughs> like it was, it was brutal. It was so bad. Right. Uh, one though, the blues looked disinterested. Billiken just looked out of sorts. Yeah. So it's an interesting dynamic. I mean, I, I just remember the first part of this conference season thinking, look, it's just going to take a couple of years to get, you know, the program where she wants it. It's fine. We'll be patient. No idea that this was, a matter of weeks away from happening. No, I, I just, I, if anyone saw that coming, I think they're, they're, they're lying. Yeah. <laughs> At least anyone outside the program anyway. Uh, but the thing is they all believed it. I mean, yeah. Colin Surrey bought in. He's not even yeah. on the damn team, but he's around them enough to yeah. know. Get, I mean, you they, a, they... get you a championship ring, Colin. Right. <laughs> Yeah. Oh man. Uh did we already run down the all the all conference awards because No, I but I, I did yeah, I just wanted to make sure that we knew people were aware. You know, Brooke Flowers is is up for Naismith Defensive Player of the Year. She's one of ten semifinalists um, you know, for the award. And then all conference teams, um, Martinez made the all defensive team, as did Flowers. Um and Flowers was the co- Defensive Player of the Year, Second Team All Conference, McMakin also Second Team All Conference. I kind of hate when they give go, co awards. You know, like I, I make up your mind. I th- I, I don't know. Maybe because she won it out. Right, okay, last year. okay, Boomer. <laughs> I know. I also gripe about like the six person um, yeah. teams instead of the five. It's got to be five or or ten because yeah. that would conceivably be. Uh, a roster, a uh, uh, sure. college basketball roster. Sure, sure. I guess conference expansion, expansion, um, you know, makes it uh, necessary. Did I hear on the broadcast that like you can only have one player per team, but like that can't be right because I feel like we had three players. Yeah, on, that that two, didn't seem we right had to two me either. Players. No, we had two players on the on the defensive all defensive team. team. Yeah, so they 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 got that wrong because I I heard that same thing and I was like that doesn't sound right. Huh. Um, let's uh, we're gonna come back talk a little bit of Billiken women recruiting. Um, we had a little bit of. Do you want to say anything before we move on? Because like this is kind of a crazy like deal. Like what? It, what like the Billiken women's basketball team is going to the NCAA tournament with a seventeen and seventeen record. Uh, I mean, it's, and, and being the best damn team in the Atlantic 10. Ah, uh, like I'm telling you, that was not an upset. Mm. What we saw today was not an upset. Um, this team is really good. Certainly didn't feel like it. No, I mean the the last, you know, the games that they played against Rhode Island and and UMass, again, the best two teams in conference, those were peers, right? Like that, like everything I saw was just um, you know, they were they were playing against their peers. Well, I guess the, the 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 place that I would leave this conversation, Zach, is, you know, we're I think we're a week away from Selection Sunday for the women's tournament. Um, what kind of seed do you think we're looking at here? Uh, the bracketology on ESPN has us as a 15 seed heading to Iowa City <laughs> to play uh, Caitlin. What's her last name? Caitlin Clark. Caitlin yeah. Clark and uh, the Iowa Hawkeyes. Uh, yeah, that would be a trip. I mean, like, uh, you know, it's not too far from home and a lot of eyes are going to be on that game. What is she's the drive? a superstar. What is the drive there? To um, Is it you said it's in, in Ames, Iowa City, 
So it would be in Iowa City. Mm -hmm. I uh, think that, so. Yeah, it's about a four hour drive. We we went up there. Um, I think it was my junior year on on New Year's Eve to play. If if that was a like, I don't know. Like, I don't think I'm gonna be able to make. Like, I really want to go, but I just don't think I can do it. Right. Like, yeah. I just don't think I can swing it this time. But um, but I, I guess I'm curious. Um, do they play home sites for? I don't think for so. the early rounds or is that so. it, it just would work out like that yeah i think that's kind of where they probably have the best well it's it's weird because you're still looking at like small facilities mm -hmm. um because i mean you're still not going to get like major turnout at least for the first couple of rounds um yeah i so don't know uh, beginning in 2023, the Sweet 16 Elite Eight, so the regionals will be held at two sites per year with eight teams at each site. So that's kind of interesting. The two regionals this year are in Greenville, South Carolina, and, at, and in Seattle, and then the final four is in Dallas. But I don't um, I don't see where the early rounds – all right, so I've got a little, I've got a little homework to do before um, yes. speaking to – We were to, not expecting – No, <laughs> we weren't. We really weren't. Uh, so yeah, let, let's uh, let's let's move on, and we'll have plenty more to say about uh, about that. Uh, well, we'll just say that uh, this news uh, was qu quietly passed down, and uh, I can tell you that uh, uh, people with deep pockets uh, and expensive taste are very excited about this. Uh, Peter Millar, uh, the they announced this a long time ago and then everyone kind of forgot about it or put it on a back burner. And then it just kind of showed up in the Billiken bookstore on Monday, uh, the 27th. Yeah. It was pretty odd. Right. I mean, like, it, and it, they're still not on the website. They're still not on the Peter Millar website. No, it's almost like the, the brand itself just doesn't want to have anything to do to do with the rollout. It was more like, we'll make a few of our standard, cuts for you and that's that um but but yeah pretty weird I, I guess um yeah at the end of february these just kind of popped up on slew's bookstore website like you said um two polo shirts two quarter zips what do you what do you think of the actual stuff zach i mean is this uh, stuff we're gonna see you wearing uh probably not unless i have a rich benefactor uh <laughs> uh buying me these out for these 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 shirts uh, it, uh the price point is well high yeah it's it's about what what is it about 112 for a polo and like 145 for one of the quarter zips look i mean the people i know who wear them um love them they say they're really really nice stuff and i guess yeah. you know it's um i'm not a golfer so like this is just it's not for me <laughs> like i don't want to pay that Clearly, much for you are not a golfer not a golfer um i, I, <laughs> I don't want to pay that much for uh stuff to look like i'm play a sport that i don't actually play um so yeah so i you know it's not for me it's not my stuff um but uh but yeah i do know people who swear by it zach so i i think there's definitely a market for it um i think they've got collections with a lot of our other sort of peer institutions i, I want to say dayton's got some stuff um Xavier, you know, some of those kind of schools. So I, I, I guess it was, them. I guess it was time, but I, I just think it's interesting that when you look at, at Peter Millar and all their college stuff on their website, we're, we're not there. This is almost like Slu just slapped a logo on a Peter Millar shirt. No, oh, it's bootleg, huh? No, I, I, well, I <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't know. It doesn't make sense to me that Peter Millar wouldn't add, unless they haven't actually released the, I don't know, but it's, it's, uh, quite pricey. I'll tell you that much. Yeah. Um, and looking at their website, I, I don't know if they, if it's just because our conference isn't one of the ones that they have a more, I don't know. They just have the power conferences, you know, listed on their, on their, what well, is a power outfit? Peter I guess Malone. that's true. Yeah. Well, the, oh, sorry, the power schools, the, and, uh, the Ivy league. Yes. Well, dude, they gotta have the Ivy league. <laughs> uh, I mean, they they definitely have like the Southern conferences down, right? Like sure, SEC, sure, sure. Uh, whatever conference Liberty's in, Atlantic Sun. I don't, I don't see that. I don't see Southern's Liberty. on there. I know that. Though. 
I they, just... Yeah, they do have an HBCU section, but it's not on like their main college um, college page. Although here, here now, I'm going alphabetically now. They do have an alphabetical listing and SLU is still not on there. Um, so this is every school, right? So there's some like Sacred Heart. There's some small ones on here. Shaw University, Stevens Institute of Technology. So South some... Harmon Institute of Technology. <laughs> so there's some really small schools on here. And uh, and SLU is not is not up. So I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what the deal is. Um, why this why this became so quiet, why they scrubbed any mention of it from social media and why it just kind of popped up. But whatever they they and they, they didn't respond to any of our requests either, Zach. Uh, you, you know, you don't want to be wearing uh, your white Peter Millar shirt when you're digging in to a freshly opened jar of two men salsa, right, Pete? That's right. And I learned that lesson the hard way, Zach. Uh, today, coming in from doing some yard work, you had a little bit left of the uh, the, the hot mango uh, salsa, which is so good, by the way. Uh, that one's really, really grown on me. And uh, and yeah, sure enough, in addition to all of the stains from yard work, I had a and nice... then it was on you. It not only grew on you, it fell on you too. It fell on me, but you got to do the little save, right? Like I'm I'm reaching down, I'm yep. trying to oh. save it as fast as possible, but I still got the red circle on my shirt. Oh. So it's a lesson for everyone here. I think you got to wear a bib or something. Maybe maybe no shirt at all when you're when you're enjoying your two men in a garden salsa, and you can find all their products, of course, at two men in a garden dot com. Uh, hot water, uh, club soda, club soda, club soda. All right. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, that was, oh, I are like, I'm thinking about, uh, you're talking about stains. Now I'm thinking of like, uh, angels in the outfield when he gets the, uh, the nachos on him, and then JP dumps the soda on him. So he thinks it's the same as club. soda. Ah, uh, it's a great movie. Uh, 79, 67 loss for the men's basketball team on Tuesday, the 28th. Uh, Pete, I forgot this game happened. Me too. A lot has happened since then. So um, much has happened. Yeah. Yeah. We, I mean, we, so this was a weird one. You know, we find out an hour before tip off that Okoro is going to miss the game with an undisclosed illness. Um, you know, SLU had never won in their building before the Seagull Center heading into it. And that's not going to change this year. Now, 0 and 8 all time in that building. And we're 5 and 13 against VCU. We've only played them since they joined the A 10. Um, not, uh, not great. No, we played them in the CBI. Oh, I'm sorry. That's right. Yeah. That was, that was the first time we ever played yeah. them. Yeah. And then they joined the eights on the next year. That was right. Um, so yeah, Zach, this, this Tuesday, it was Tuesday, February 28th. And you're right. It feels like three weeks ago or more. Yeah. VCU got a lot of what they really wanted going to the basket early. Uh, slew did adjust though. Switched to his zone for a while and it kind of flummoxed them um, really limited in the half court offense because they, they just don't have a lot of shooting threats. Right. I mean, like, so, so a zone makes sense against VCU. They do have the kind of athletes who can break you down off the dribble. Um, but we kind of got away from that zone. You know, we led 35 31 um, at halftime. And then I just didn't see the zone again. You know, we go out in the second half, we shoot 41% from the field 29 percent from three uh couldn't make a free throw you get out of the zone and then you you lose by 12 and it was just it was it was all the same bad habits we see popping up again we're settling for contested layups um didn't set each other up for threes jimerson went quiet like the, like they just weren't feeding him turned it over 11 times in the second half 20 in the game and most of these they, it's not like vcu was swarming it was just bad decision-making, bad passes, bad ball, ball handling, and then just being really soft with the ball. Um, Slew's efforts slipped, VCU pounced, and then they looked rattled yet again on the road. I know the atmosphere is tough there, but man, oh man, did they, they, just, they just buckled in this game. It's something we've seen every damn game. It happens over and over and over again. Yeah. And it's, I mean, you know, it's hard to pin it all on coaching when it happens so many times. And there is a lot to be said about the shortcomings for Travis Ford. Uh, but I mean, dude, like at the end of the day, you got to 
you, there's guys on the court that are making the decisions in the moment. And I mean, if, figure something out. We have a lot of experience. We have a lot of fourth and fifth year players, a lot of guys in their 20s. We have a guy and, that's a dad for crying out loud. <laughs> I mean, like they're talk about an experience. They're of an age and experience level where you don't necessarily need the coach constantly telling you what to do. Like you guys have to be poised. You have to be confident in your own abilities. You have to be communicating with one another. Um, this is the kind of stuff you see from like, you know, a, a freshman team that's really talented and surprising people. And then, you know, the teams kind of figure them out, adjust, and then beat them with their experience. But it's like, it looks like the opposite of that, right? Like super experienced and yet the little things get to them. Um, I don't understand it at all, how they keep settling into these same bad habits and um, and letting teams that they very well could and should beat um, get to them. One of the things that bothers me so much, Zach, is that VCU and Dayton are not that good this year. They're just not. We have faced much better VCU teams than this. Like when I watch them play, I'm just it, it, it almost feels like SLU beating themselves because these teams just – they're not overwhelming us with, with depth and talent and shooting and, and, and relentless defense and some of the other things that are, can, you know, justifiably beat you. Like they're just, I don't know. They're just catching they're just adjusting. They're catching up. They're out hustling slew. It's, it's just so frustrating to watch. Yeah. A couple, speaking of energy, um, we got really good energy from Hargrove in this one. He had a nice game um forrester also uh really serviceable in yeah uh filling in for a coro in this one yeah but both of them i think like everybody else they were just better in the first half forrester had nine seven and three at halftime um hargrove great energy especially in the first half and got a season high 15 points but 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 you know so so forrester goes from nine seven and three and ends up with 14 10 and four not a lot of second half production you know he's still good overall um, but look, both of those guys gave us more than everybody else. Jimerson had two made field goals, um, along with four fouls and five turnovers. He was just bad in this one. Um, and then Collins, Yuri Collins, eight turnovers on eight assists. He didn't score until well into the second half. Um, and he, he just wasn't effective moving the ball around late in the game. Um, when we settle for contested layups at the rim, he's the worst violator of that. He finished, this is a crazy number, plus minus, he was minus 20 in the game minus 20 by far the worst on the team most guys were negative but the next one after him was negative nine it's incredible to see that number out of uh collins just That's just absolutely good. unacceptable um parker, i don't know i don't know uh, what got into him uh parker found himself buried at the end of the bench in this one kind of odd jimerson really looked like he could have used some help I, yeah i i I I made that note thinking like, like, look, Parker was not, I think he only played three minutes and he wasn't great in those three minutes, but um, that happens a lot with him, right? He gives you a couple minutes that look shaky and then he he'll he'll hit a shot or he'll do with something that kind of gets him going. He just needs some run. He needs some time. Kind of felt like he could have been good in this one. I don't know if, um, if you agree or not, but um, I don't don't know why he found himself. To be honest. (laughs) Maybe. Maybe we should just move on to a game that we actually have some uh, clear memories about. Uh, we're going back to the UMass <laughs> game, I see. Um, 65-61 win versus Dayton on Friday the 3rd. Uh, senior night for Perkins, Pickett, Colin, Fo- Collins, Forrester, Okoro, Jimerson, Thatch, Sneezy, Happy, Dopey, Doc. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Kind of, we got a little bit of clarification, but I still don't think it clarifies anything on who's returning and who's not. It's 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 odd, right? I mean, so so we were told these are the guys who have either exhausted their eligibility, which we know for some of them for sure, or they've graduated or both. Only Collins and Jimerson would have the option of returning due to the bonus year from the pandemic. Uh, Ford's quote on this was weird. They need to pursue professional opportunities and from there they can make decisions, but they need to aggressively pursue where they are professionally um a lot of people took that as they're gone right um that that's how a lot of people interpreted that quote um i don't know 
I don't know. Did you did you read that the same way? I read it as a nothing burger. Honestly, to me, I made no like what? Okay, they need to pursue a uh, professional. I, I, I mean, at least for Jimerson, it's it's testing the draft waters, seeing where he's mm-hmm. at. Uh, I, I certainly think that Jimerson probably has the best chance of anyone on this team right now. I think so like, too. I mean, you look at the way the NBA is trending, a lot of gunners out there. Uh, if he can, you know, defense is all effort and work. And if he can get his defense down, uh, there's nothing stopping him from having a career in the NBA. Yeah, I think he would benefit from an NBA style offense as well. I I, I could see his game translating. I mean, he's 6'5", six, 6'6". Six, six. He's got good size. He's definitely got some things to work on, but... Um, he's a guy they'll at least be aware of. So, um, I, yeah, I'm certainly curious to see where these guys go and what they do. Um, one omission that I thought was interesting, Zach, the only guy I thought may have been up there was Hargrove. Is this a sign that he'll be back next year, you think? I, I think he will, uh, yeah. unless he transfers again. Like, I mean, I said last year he could trade. I mean, I, I wouldn't have been surprised if he maybe headed over to Edwardsville. Um, you know, we'll see. I. Yeah. I don't know. I think he loves playing here, and I think he, he I think he gets a lot out of it, uh, emotionally, mentally, all that good stuff. And I, I can't imagine him not coming back. Honestly, yeah, it seems like being close to family is important. Um, in his case, more than anybody else's. So, um, I, I could see him returning. Um, I also want to just shout out the managers: Ike Beck, Sean Kim, Josh McCalla. Jacob Reznikoff, they all got honored as well. Um, it does mean a lot, you know, when you're a manager, you put in that much work. And on my senior day, there were about 70 people uh, because we were on our way to a nine and 21 season. And that was our last home game in a 20,000 seat arena. So uh, it can be a little lonely out there if things aren't going well, but I, uh, I do want to shout those guys out and uh, you know, they, they do great work. Yeah. Um, just under 10,000 in attendance. Shave its capacity is 10,600. This was fantastic atmosphere, I thought. Yeah. Yeah. Good turnout. Were you surprised by it, given how they played lately or anything like that? Um, On my way into the arena, uh, I think I texted you, said, I don't know if I'm going to make it to tip um, <laughs> or at, by tip. And I really didn't. Uh, it was that bad. Tra- was it, traffic uh, was that bad? Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Traffic. Traffic was bad. Try to think. Uh, I know around there it was bad trying to get places near the arena, like trying yeah. to get into the garage. Like there was a back. Like I got in there and I sat down with about 10 minutes to go and I looked around and it was probably 60 to 70% full. And I turned to the people with me. I go, this place is going to be absolutely packed. Yeah. It, yeah. it was just crazy. We were getting a lot of flack from Dayton people on Twitter. Um, they were just kind of like, we're all your fans that we're all your fans. And then I was seeing slew fans being like, I'm going to be late. Traffic's terrible. Traffic's horrible. Nobody go through, you know, blah, 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 yep. intersection and stuff like that. So um, it did seem like that was a very real, um, a, a very real factor. But, you know, in addition to the traffic, it, these these 2023 Arch Baron Cup games have not been pretty, Zach. Yeah, but this game had everything you could have wanted in an Arch Baron Cup game. I mean, you had some controversy. Jordan <laughs> Jett was courtside. Yeah. Uh, I, I, there was, you know, it was, it was, it was a lot of fun, I thought. Um, I would have preferred to beat the living shit out of them, but uh, that wasn't the case. I, I, um, I hate Dayton. I hate oh, them so bad. So worst. like if you, if you would tell me like, Oh, you're going to see the most thrilling game of your life. So who's going to win on a buzzer beater? Would you want that? Uh, no, I want to beat them 120 to 19. I, I, I hate them. I want to embarrass them. I want to shame them. I want their fans to feel bad. Um, so it's, it wasn't that satisfying of a revenge game you know, to win by four um, at home after kind of getting smacked a little bit at their place. But look, neither team shot it well. Only 12 combined turnovers in the game. Slew had eight of them, um, but a bunch of those came right at the end. Neither team seemed to want it at the end. It seemed like it was sloppy, poor decision-making, bad communication, 
poor shooting. Um, it was kind of a snapshot of the league, I thought, this year, if these were the number two and three teams this season, because they just didn't look great to me. Um, even though you said this game had a lot that you could have wanted, ugh, it just wasn't always pretty. It was, however, the first Billiken game with our brick outside the arena. Is it? Is it in? No, I didn't sure. look, but I oh, okay. Assume, so, so, so I was told it will be installed this spring. So I don't. Oh, think it's okay. No, no. Yeah. No, no. Well, we got confirmation anyway. Yeah, it's coming. It's coming. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think we should do something where, like, with like two men in a garden, if like you go take a picture with the brick and tweet it out. Like we'll get you like some sort of salsa. I don't know. We'll I like that. that. Leave leave a leave a little candle on yes, the uh, on the brick. Yes. You know. <laughs> uh, I uh, will remember. Oh wait, no, we don't want to get copyright strike. We're on YouTube. You, we can't be doing. You that. call this one a total free for all in the first half? It really you... was, dude. Like they were not calling anything on Forrester. Forrester was stray mugging dudes in the paint mm. on defense. I. I will say this, like the refs, we got, we got away with a lot on defense. I think Dayton did too. Uh, but all three fouls on Tamani Kamara were legit. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. It's crazy that they only have three, three team fouls and he had all of them. Um, I don't know if I've ever seen that before. I mean, that that's really, really weird. It's I a mean, payback for what happened at Dayton. Sure. 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 I mean, I, I'll, I'll take that. Absolutely. Retribution that we deserve. Well, yeah, I mean, like, look, o Okoro and Forrester, for those who don't remember, were just completely taken out of that game with ticky tack fouls completely. Um, so, again, I have no love loss for this team. Um, and, you know, just I don't know. The refs let them play in this one for the most part. It's just Kamara wasn't getting away with his BS, and that's fine. Um, Slu did go nine for nine from the free throw line, and they needed all of them. Uh, Perkins and Collins were the only ones who actually shot the free throws. One of them had four, the other had five, and uh, and luckily they they were on their game in that regard. Yeah, always. I mean, anytime you go to the line, I think we all still have a little PTSD from watching Hassan and Jordan uh, yeah. play uh, for four years. Uh, mm -hmm. Collins was 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 really good in this one. I thought. Uh, well, actually, hold on. Uh, Jimerson, you know, Jimerson was good. You know, just did not get the ball enough, right? We've talked about uh, he's gotten better off the ball, better defensively, better creating things like that. But at the end of the day, he still need everything runs through Yuri. He still needs Yuri to get him the ball. And when he's four for six from the field and two for four from three, to me, it's like, okay, that's a good first half. But that's his numbers in 36 minutes. It's just not enough. It's way too low. He's got to get the ball more. Uh, yeah, it's like he had a really nice first half and then the second half, he just goes, well, this happens a lot. He either, you know, he'll have, it's just weird. He does disappear. And, uh, sometimes I feel like we're not running off screens or setting screens well enough. Uh, it just doesn't look like an efforts there on offense. Uh, right. it's really weird. Uh, Okoro was really solid. I thought in this one, 10 and nine. Uh, Collins, uh, I'm not even, I'm done talking about Collins as individual accolades. <laughs> like, no, like I, I am in a lot of ways that like, it's, it's annoying because he's, he's not winning us games. 12 and 10 is what he ends up in this one. 10 assists. He breaks the a 10 season assist record with his 295th of the year, becomes the 15th player in history to reach 300 in a season now at 304. Uh, but you're right. Like that would feel a lot more meaningful if we were talking right now about what seed will, th we think we'll have in the NCAA tournament and not in the a 10 tournament. Right. I mean, that's, uh, that, that, that's where that gets frustrating. Um, Perkins has 17 in this game, but 10 of those were in the first few minutes. I mean, it, he was kind of a one man, um, scoring machine out of the gate in this one. And then again, you know, just not getting the ball enough. Um, one weird thing, Zach, like we always talk about, it feels like we get out rebounded when we don't. And this was definitely one of those games, but the other one was Dayton was eight of 24 from three. And for some reason it felt like they shot more and felt like they made more from three. It just felt like that was where all their production was coming from. I guess not, but yeah, very weird. I was heavily sedated. So 
<laughs> can't can't speak to that one. I not. just I just know. Look, I know when there's going to be a lot of people in the arena that I yeah. don't want to like deal. Like I need to be in a certain mood. And, and, you know, as much as I would love to tip a bunch of beers back, like that's just, I know better at 33. It's got, it's got to be something different. It's got to be a different vibe. <laughs> well, uh, it, it was, it was crowded and it was great to see our alums in the house. We had yes. Jordan Jet, Corey Remican sitting by each other. Jet moved over to sit by Chaffetz for a while in the second half. We had a Whitey Herzog in the house sitting courtside. With I, his, I'm going to be honest. Cane. I didn't know he was still alive. <laughs> he is. He, did you notice I his cane now. too? Is like a baseball bat. It's got the, the little no, but, hook handle, but yeah. Oh my God. That's awesome. Yeah. He had the, the blue blazer on and everything, man. He was there sitting courtside uh, with his son or his grandson. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, definitely his grandson was there with him, which was really cool. Um, it, you know, I, I lo- like this is again, we talk about the Loyola game. We talk about the Dayton game. This is why we need Belmont in this conference. Mm. I don't care how bad or good they are. I really don't. I just, I really like the idea of like fans coming in, uh, us going to them. Like it's so much easier. Like, yeah. and that's why, why Billiken fans should be trying their hardest regard. Like if we're, if we're in this conference, we're good. Like we should be pushing for more Midwestern programs to join. Yeah, I mean, and look, and I, I know Dayton likes us in the conference as well. You know, this is a it's a meaningful rivalry both ways. Um, and I think the same is already true of Loyola. Um, I, I don't think I mean, there's not as much history with Belmont, but there's no reason why that couldn't be something as well. So, yeah, we'll just have to you're right. We'll just have to keep lobbying for that if this is going to be our our spot. Pete, I mentioned about five minutes ago that I've been on this earth for 33 years mm. uh, and many, many times in that 33 years have i been misunderstood <laughs> i am very I we, fam- I'm familiar I, I think we uh i think we had another one um on 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 this game day zach how did, that, how did, did. that go down uh so i don't know man like look at, at the end of the day i i kind of meant this ambiguously right in that First of all, in a lot of people's minds, whether that be fans or pundits, uh, sports writers, blah, blah, blah. Uh, Travis Ford, as head coach of St. Louis University, he's been here for seven years. Uh, he's made one NCAA tournament. It was a, a fluke appearance. We'll call it that. Not not in that that team was probably that good. Much much like this this women's basketball team, they really were good enough uh, to make that tournament, but you know, they, they dropped a game to an overrated Virginia tech team. Um, and I think, you know, uh, I, I tweeted out that Ford's job, my Ford's job and performance as Billiken basketball head coach would come down to the next 10 days or even the next 10 hours. Now, whether that is fan sentiment, athletic de- department sentiment, booster sentiment, I can't say. Well, I can say it's fan sentiment, but I don't know again what the athletic department is thinking. I don't know what Richard Schaefitz is thinking. Um, what I do know, however, Pete, uh, is that it, since the Dayton win, it feels like Travis Ford's been on a little bit of a, a PR tour, uh, just trying to let people know, hey, we beat Dayton. This team had this team looked good. Yeah, exp- expound on that a little bit because I've I've really been offline most sure. of the weekend. You know, even watching the women's game, I was doing it like while I was doing yard work. Like I, I just um, I've been been either busy with kids or other stuff going on all weekend, so I haven't been as online, and I haven't quite seen the 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 um, the positive publicity tour that that you might be referring yeah. to. Yeah. So really, like. I mean, it's kind of started in the post game senior night stuff. It was very much like what people could call excuses. Uh, you know, uh, we've had a tough, these guys have been through a lot. They, you know, they've battled injuries, all the stuff. And you're like, okay, dude, we get it. Like, let's just like he, and there was more to it. It wasn't, you know, he talked about the COVID year and we can, you know, if you, we want to rehash that the COVID shutdown. Uh, it's not a fun conversation to have, 
Um, and then, you know, he's out at Humphreys behind the bar. Like, dude, yeah, cool. You beat Dayton. But, like, it's not that, like, it's not. you. You're clearly giving away booze. Like, I know what you're doing. You're tying yourself to a really positive thing that you just did 10, you know, a half hour, hour ago. Like you're, you're highlighting it. I've done this. Like I just, it feels weird to me, man. Like I'm all for celebrating wins, but uh, I don't think beating Dayton in a down year is get behind the bar at Humphreys worthy, like go crazy, have a party worthy. I think, you know, there's uh, look, and I could be wrong here. Look, this could be like the moment where the team is like, Oh hell yeah. Travis Ford's our guy. Let's go to war for him because he's behind the bar at Humphreys. But, hey, I could be wrong. This could be the string, like the hard hats back in the day. Like, it could be the thing that Galvin, I don't know. I doubt it, but. Um, well, and, and to be clear, we want to be wrong. Yes. At that point, right? Like, yeah, we want to win. Um, hey, if you're I, rooting against the Billikens, you're an ass. I'm sorry. Yeah. It doesn't. It, like and you, that did bubble up some, you know, like um, even in response to that tweet and some others, like there were people saying uh, almost like they wanted to tank the rest of the season just to 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 rip off the bandaid and start over. And I, I don't agree with that. And then also uh, we got called way too negative. So yeah. we're getting we're getting it from both angles. Uh, we really are. Yeah. I like just. That's, that's, so uh, what I will say and where I think. um the tweet, you know, a- a- ambiguous and debatable as as it might have been in some people's eyes. I think fan sentiment is different right now uh, this season than than it has been in a long time. There are a lot of people I know, and I and I know this is anecdotal evidence, and it's not numbers, but there but are I people mean, you know, there there were people at senior night that were like get like they were coming very close to heckle territory. And, but where I was going with that is um, they are season ticket holders who are talking about not renewing. And these are people who have had season tickets, you know, in, 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 in my generation's case now, look, I've been out of college, uh, God, 18 years. So there are people who have had season tickets since basically since Shafe it's opened, right? Like, um, you know, 15, 16 seasons ago. Um, There are people I know who have had season tickets since before I was born who have mentioned to me that they might not renew. Like, it's just, you know, it's just not what it used to be. Um, so it's not just my generation of, of alums who are kind of in that, that middle zone where they're, you know, they've got kids who are now getting into like activities and other stuff going on. Their lives are busy um, coming down on a Tuesday night to watch us eke out a win over LaSalle isn't always the most exciting thing right. to do. Um it, and and so so a lot of people I know who have been super loyal through thick and thin through uh you know from how many coaches going back I mean guys um Soderberg and uh Majerus Cruz like every, like they've been through highs and lows ups and downs all kinds of conference changes and any anything that you can think of that we've been through they've been through and they've stuck it out through. And this year has just broken people mm-hmm. and in a, in a way that um, I don't think any of us saw coming. And, and, and I, part of that is just the expectations, but it's almost like it, this, I think Jack Godar made this point a while back. It's almost like this season being disappointing is more psychologically damaging than any other, just because of the expectations, the timing, the way everything lined up. It was just, it had to be this year and it hasn't been then. I don't know if another run in Brooklyn to make the NCAA tournament changes all of those minds or not. I just, I don't know. I think we would probably not only have to do that, but maybe win a tournament game. Um, And I don't know if I see this team doing that. Yeah, no, I I don't. Uh, It's unfortunate, but I mean, look, Hey, I would absolutely love a run. I would love it. It would be the best. Oh yeah. I'm, (laughs) I'm I'm rooting for that a hundred percent. I absolutely want that to happen. I, I'm not I'm not taking like any kind of like cynical long view here. I I just want to win. I I and we like Travis. He's been on the show multiple times. I'm not rooting against him at all. I like him. Um, I love the guy. I I just want to win. I just I just want to say like when we tweet something like that, it's not coming from a place of negativity for the sake of negativity. So I I yeah, it's 
um, what, whatever you want to say to us about it. Um, that's where we're coming from. Yeah. We, we, we have a, we have a, an obligation to, to speak our mind, I think on a lot of things. And I don't think we've ever been, uh, too far one way or the other, except for maybe Kent Miller's tenure here as volleyball coach, <laughs> which is now over. Yes. It's long gone, long gone. Pete, some, some, you know, some more positive news. Um, first of all, Kellen Thames, uh, some news on a potential medical red shirt. Yeah. Ford said they're basically pursuing one. Um, he thinks they're, they're, they're confident after doing their due diligence on it, but there's no guarantee. He said, you still have to get the waiver. Um, but I think, you know, he was hurt mid season, didn't get a lot of publicity. And, um, I think they're going to, you know, based on him not appearing all that much this season, they're going to go ahead and try for the medical red shirt um, because that, that would have cut out a big chunk of his season anyway. Yes. Um, he was hit by a car riding his scooter. Yeah. That's, that's my understanding uh, as well. Um, I, I think he's okay now, you know, but uh, uh, I don't think it was ever super serious, but, but, but still, you know, um, I, I hope that they can process that and, and get it done for him. Uh, from physical injuries to maybe uh, mental uh, injuries, so to speak, I guess. I don't know. Mm, oh, was that I don't a know bad, about that one. Was that a bad transition? <laughs> I wouldn't have made it. Okay, fine. Uh, I take it all back. Cut that out. Uh, the producer. producer. Uh, Pete, tell us about the nice uh, award uh, presented to Terrence Hargrove. The U.S. Basketball Writers Association 2023 Perry Wallace Most Courageous Award is what he's um, receiving. Um, he's going to share the award with Utah State's Connor Odom. These two are being honored for coming forward to share their struggles with their mental health this season. And um, the ceremony to honor them will take place in Houston during Final Four weekend in April. So big deal. I mean, we you know we covered that when when Hargrove uh, you know talked to Stu and and that article came out several weeks ago in the post dispatch um covered that at the time and talked about just how big it was for him to step up and um you know get his mind right take care of himself and and come forward and talk to people about this and say like hey this is this is stuff a lot of us go through and there's just been a culture of silence around it in sports for so long and uh it's a big deal for him and and other guys to do that and for that to be recognized on a national level is huge. It also means Stu's work got some attention there as well. So just a really nice thing to come out of SLU right there. Um, yeah. Perry Wallace uh, was the first player to integrate uh, the SEC. Uh, Connor Odom is um, uh, he's been open about dealing with a combination of Lyme disease, anxiety, and obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, when he was 13, he would shower for hours to feel clean and found it difficult to leave home. Uh, he lost an entire season of high school basketball to illness. And I mean, that since, stuff's no joke, man. Uh, to, to, to overcome that and be a college athlete is is huge. Um, I'm glad those guys are getting what they need. And in a, not all that long ago, he would be in – I mean, where would he be right now? You know, like he he wouldn't have gotten the resources he needs to like – get back on track, go to college, play sports. No, he'd be, he, where would he be? Who knows? Um, so, I'm, you know, glad he got that help. Perry Wallace, by the way, came up recently because we were talking about uh, Pistol Pete's uh, scoring record going down. Um, to put that in perspective, the year that Pistol Pete showed up at LSU was the year that Perry Wallace showed up at Vanderbilt, the first black player in the SEC in, in, in basketball. And other teams did not integrate that same season. It took a while. It was a trickle in the sec perry wallace and the other players who were the first of that generation to start playing at those schools went through a lot like the national guard had to escort these dudes onto campus in some cases um so very very deserved that the award is named after him and it's it's a big deal for hargrove to win something like that that's cool ghosts of Ole miss is one of my favorite uh 30 for 30s like low-key favorite mm. like ones that doesn't that nobody really talks about right um Let's whip it around the A-10 really, really quick because we have been mm -hmm. at this for a while. Uh, Tuesday the 28th, Dayton beats LaSalle 77-53. Wednesday the 1st, St. Joe's 83, Richmond 67. Duquesne 88, UMass 79. 
George Washington, 75, Davidson, 70, George Mason, 60, Fordham, 58 in overtime. Um, Rhode Island, 79, Loyola, 77, uh, Saturday the 4th, uh, Mason, 62, Richmond, 60, Loyola, 76, LaSalle, 73, Fordham, 87, Duquesne, 60, UMass, 71, St. Bonaventure, 60, VCU, 74, George Washington, 68, Davidson, 68, Rhode Island, 54. Uh, Pete, A-10 preview. I, I, give us the lowdown, man. So Slew's the four seed, as we know now, um, with, with Fordham beating Duquesne in that game. Uh, that you just you know gave the score on Fordham gets the three seed with the tiebreaker, and and St. Louis is the four seed on the same side as number one VCU. Good news, double bye. Bad news is I don't like the draw honestly. Uh, Twelve and thirteen on that side are Richmond and UMass, and then the winner plays George Mason and Zach. I don't want to play George Mason again. That's not the first team I would want to see. We were lucky to escape with that win. If you remember, that's the game where kind of a no. controversial finish with Okoro um, on the baseline. And there was that contact that didn't get called. To be it, fair, we got screwed the entire freaking entire game. game. Yeah, it was horrible. But like it, this also means we're, we've got to deal with the most annoying fan base in the 810. Oh, uh, that's, a, that's a debatable one. It is debatable. And yeah, it's probably still Dayton. Dayton, you know, gets the Lifetime Achievement Award there. But uh, Mason has got a really irritating. I genuinely conference. forget they are in this conference. If it wasn't for PD Buckets being ever present online, I like him, but I can't. Yeah, he's fine. I can't stand the rest of their online presence. It's like no. every single one of them is like the most irritating. Uh, whatever. Anyway, they're annoying. Um, VCU will play uh, number eight Davidson or number nine Bonaventure. Um, and I already gave Slew's line up there. St. Joe's. And Loyola are the 10 and 15 seed playing in the pillow fight. The winner will take on George Washington. And the winner of that will take on number two Dayton on Thursday. Uh, LaSalle's the 11, Rhode Island's the 14. That's the third and final pillow fight matchup. The winner will take on number six Duquesne. And then the winner of that gets number three Fordham. Um, so, th so that's what it looks like up through the quarterfinals. Kind of a quirk of the tournament to remind people of this year. Those first three rounds, the pillow fight, the 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 um whatever you would call the next round, second round, um, are and then the uh the quarterfinals are on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. They take Friday off. They play I the kind of like it. They play the semifinals on Saturday and the finals on Sunday at uh one Eastern noon St. Louis time. So just a heads up that that's the format um, this season. It's a, it's a little bit different, but overall, Zach, the bracket, I mean, what, what do you think? Do you, what do, you, do you, Mason, do you want to avoid them um, VCU? Or would you rather be on the other side with Dayton? This conference stinks on ice. <laughs> Nobody and it does me. not. And it does not matter. Nobody scares me. Um, but you know, if, if I, l l I don't want to play Mason, but look, am I afraid of them? No, not really. Um, I don't want to play Oduro. I don't want to deal with their fan base. I don't want to, the fact that we play them after kind of a controversial finish makes, you know, they, they could be a little extra motivated, but they've been wildly inconsistent this year. I, I just don't, you never know what you're going to get out of them. Uh, yeah. I, I think we, we I, I don't know, man. I don't know what this team offers us right now. Mm. Um, but I mean, I think anybody can win this, you know, Fordham oh. winning it would be on brand. Yeah, nothing would surprise me. Uh. No, no outcome. It's A ten really is the sicko conference of all sicko conferences. It truly is. Uh, trivia question of the week last week: uh, Which A ten team has slew men's basketball played less than any other? And I, uh, I had a thought on this, Pete. Uh, I think the le le least is actually temple yeah kind of a so so what and and what's give well me actually the, it'll probably probably be butler that's true <laughs> well except we've um hist over time we've played but butler my before. point so my point was which a10 team is slew men's basketball played less than any other and it's 
what did we play them in conference right when we played them so i would say it's down to temple or butler if you really even want to count butler as an a10 team well the the issue with butler is if you include yeah so yeah while we were in the a10 we didn't play them that much but if you include what what the question was in history you know so 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 when you take into account any team that's ever played in the a10 it would be temple the least yes um uh but uh but no i'm sorry since we joined the a10 um it would be temple but um but yeah while I guess teams that are still in the A10, it would be Davidson. Um, we're four and eight against them. And then the team we've played most ever would be Dayton. We're 20 Don't say it. 40. Um, although lie. I should, I, I think I got to update that. Is it 30 and 40 now? I, um, yeah, it might be. Yeah. All right. I, I might need to update that. But regardless, um, the, those are the. Those are the most and least, although I like I like the idea of throwing Temple in there. Um, congrats to Joel Hall, who got the schools right, but not the supporting details um, in terms of who else we've played the most. And uh, and on Twitter, and then SlewFan13 on Billikens.com. Zach, what did you want to ask the people this week? All right, so I want to try something new this week, and, and who knows, it may... It may just to be where I just do get this bug up my ass with curiosity and I don't, I'm too lazy to write a trivia question and too lazy to do the research on my question. Um, so the Billiken men's soccer team won the A-10 championship. Billiken women's soccer won the A-10 championship. Billiken women's basketball wins the A-10 championship. This all took place in one school year. Has there ever been a program and we're talking like, let's, let's limit it to men's basketball, women's basketball, men's soccer, women's soccer, baseball, softball, the team centric sports, right? Uh, I guess we could throw in field hockey. That's fine. Whatever sport that slew fields, that's team centric. um, That meaning game centric, I should say. So not races, not meets. Uh, no offense, but it's easier just to play it out. So is there any program in the A-10 that has ever held three championships at the same time or more? Mm-hmm. That's what I want to know. So uh, please do research out there because you people uh, have way, uh, you guys are way better than me. All right. uh, real like quick. That. Real quick, Pete, run us down the women's basketball commitments. We talked a little bit about this, that they are really going for size. We skipped over this last week for some reason. Um, But last Tuesday, we got word on social media about all three of them, um, three commitments in a day. And we now kind of have an answer to the question of what Tillett was going to do to replace her outgoing front court players um, after not signing anyone in the fall. First off, you've got Brooklyn Gray, a 5'11 freshman from Rockford, Illinois. She attends Wabash Valley College in Mount Carmel, Illinois, um, where she averages about 13 points a game, four and a half rebounds a game, and 2.2 assists. She's really progressed steadily all season and has scored 21 or more in each of the past four games um, for a 25-1 and team that's won 25 straight. Um, So she's really developed quickly there. Um, Tierra Simon is one of two from Pearl River, uh, community college to commit to SLU together. Basically, she's a six-two sophomore forward, averages six points a game, six point eight rebounds, and two blocks a game. She's from Houston and appeared in twenty-eight games as a freshman for Prairie View A and M before transferring to Pearl River and kind of taking her game up a notch. Um, the second Pearl River player and third overall player of the day uh, to commit to SLU is Markavia Shavers. A 6'2 forward, um, a, sorry, a 6'2 sophomore forward center, averaging 6.9 points a game and 8.4 rebounds per game. Um, she's from Biloxi, Mississippi. Ton of size, strength, toughness. Um, that that's that's two players right there, Zach, who are 6'2. And you know, she's got the 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 bigger frame and everything. But I think the idea here is front court depth, ton of rebounding. None of them are putting up huge numbers, like eye-popping numbers, but those rebound um, uh, attributes, I think, are, are what she's looking to to translate um, at the D1 level. So I think that's, uh, you know, Brooke Flowers is, is one of a kind. She's going to be tough to replace, but I think she's going to try and do it with depth and not just a, a one-for-one replacement. 
out of the gate. Uh, Billiken baseball got off to a rocky start uh, against Marshall in Hoover, Alabama, but turn around and win four games. Uh, an eleven, they kicked it off on Tuesday the twenty eighth at Itchy Jones Stadium on the campus of Carbondale. Eleven uh, three win, Pete. Yeah. Yeah, big one. And gotta love the name Itchy Jones, by the way. Cameron Swanger drove in five runs in this one, including a three home run homer, three run homer in the sixth. Um, Slew had a 3-0 lead in the first, uh, starting with the Patrick Closey solo shot. In addition to those two, Tyler Fogarty and Cole Smith all, both had two hit days. Um, staff game for the pitchers. No one went more than two and a third innings. Dawson Smith ended up with the win. And then Zach, they got the sweep against St. Thomas this weekend, March 4th, 5th. Uh, playing a doubleheader Saturday due to bad weather on Friday. Yeah. By the way, I'm going to go by Scratchy Miller from now on. Four-one <laughs> uh, win Saturday the fourth in Game One. This game started at noon. Uh, it was pushed back, uh, like you said. Henry Littman, which is a the name, it sounds like somebody's neighbor in like a a movie. Sounds like a kid's neighbor, Henry, Litt, Mr. Littman, yeah. uh, started and pitched six scoreless innings. Slew scored three in the bottom of the eighth to break a 1-1 tie. Small ball, stringing some singles together. Uh, Jack Weber got the win. 6-5 and 13 innings Saturday the 4th. That's game two. Uh, uh, this is not the first time they've had a long uh, doubleheader. If you remember, they did play three games last year in one day, I believe. Yeah. Uh, brute, but of course, still brutal to play a long one like this in a second leg of a doubleheader. Austin Newway got uh, a homer in the eighth to tie it at three. Uh, this one was capped by a 3 2 13th inning, the winning run across the plate after Knox Preston, uh, which is a great name for the Harvard lacrosse team, was hit by a pitch with the bases loaded. That's such a damn college baseball way to end a game. A 13 inning game, no less. Oh, my God. Uh, five, two Sunday, the fifth, uh, so got out to a two Oh start in the first, the Tommies tied it in the following frame. And then slew added runs in the third, fourth and seventh. Owen Chafin got the win and grant Fremion with the save next up Lindenwood on at Lindenwood on Tuesday, March 7th. Then they host Northwestern for a three game series on the 10th and 11th. Uh, a couple players added to the class of 2023 Pete. Yeah, we've already heard about seven of them, and they added three more who are going to show up in the fall. They're all right-handed pitchers. Alex Foreman out of Rolling Hills Estates in California, uh, Palos Verdes High School. Owen what Kelly. What? Why do I know Palos Verdes? I don't know. I don't know. Okay, That's a go good. Go on. Sorry. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> Owen Kelly from Swansea, Illinois, goes to Belleville East, and then Jackson Yarberry from Lake St. Louis goes to Timberland High School. Um, so, like I said, they'll join the other seven who have already been announced for the 2023 class. And uh, we'll see them on campus starting this fall, pitching next season. Is Palace Verdes the the school from Bring It On? Um, I, I don't know. I've never seen Bring yeah, It On. Yeah, it is. I think it is, man. Um, oh God. <laughs> <laughs> i'm so sorry everybody it's it's uh, it's late in the show it's late yes, we're slap no. we're slap happy at this uh, point softball pete lipscomb tournament on march 3rd through the 5th in nashville featuring lipscomb providence and youngstown state yeah it seemed to be a pretty competitive event for SLU. they were all um you know mostly pretty competitive games they won the first nine to four against providence on friday this is just the gabby kowalik game four for four three home runs and six RBI. Her four, uh, her fourth hit was a triple. Those three homers tire for the program record in home runs in a game. By the way, um, then they won a two-one eight inning game. The next day against Youngstown State, Chloe Wendling went the distance for the win. Abby Mallow went two for four and drove in the winning run. Uh, Providence beat them four to two uh, in the second leg of that uh, that Saturday. Um, Slu got the first two runs in the first inning, starting with a koala homer. And didn't have any answers for Providence after that. Um, Taylor Hockman got the loss. Nine inning game on Sunday the 5th to start uh, the day. Um, they lose it 9-8 to Youngstown State. Pretty back and forth. Slew had a 6-2 lead 
um, that Youngstown State erased with five runs in the fifth. Taylor Hockman got the loss again in this one. Um, Chloe Ryan and Jocelyn Abbott each had three RBIs. And then um, in the final game, they lost 4 nothing to Lipscomb. Um, Chloe Wendling got the loss in this one. Nothing really to say about the bats there. Next up, they'll play SIUE on the road on March 8th. And then they'll host the Billiken opening round robin featuring Bradley in Northern Illinois on March 11th and 12th. Uh, really quick, running through women's tennis. Men's tennis did not play. 4-3 loss versus SIUE on Thursday, March 2nd at St. Clair Tennis Club. 4-0 loss versus Western Kentucky on the 4th at St. Clair. As I said, men's tennis did not play, but they have Southern Indiana on the 11th. Pete, a couple of volleyball assistant coaches. Andrea Beatty is rounding out her staff nicely. She is, and I, I like this first hire, Amber Hildebrandt, um, 11 years of combined playing and coaching experience at the college level, most recently at Oakland, um, her alma mater, where she served as associate head coach and recruiting coordinator. She was also interim head coach there, so pretty similar background, honestly, to, to Coach Beatty. Um, coach for two stints at Appalachian State with two years and assistant at Xavier in between. Um, she graduated from Oakland in 2013, and her class was the winningest in program history, started her career as a volunteer assistant there. Her husband, Mitch, and this is this was fun for me because um, he was just named performance analyst for STL City, but he was the goalie for FC Cincinnati as they were beginning the transition to MLS. And his goalkeeping led to some major upsets in the U.S. Open Cup, including, I think, one over Chicago and Miami or something like that. Um, he was two classes ahead of her at Oakland, so that's that's how they met. But that's a he, that dude was a big deal in, in Cincinnati. He'll probably never buy, have to buy a beer here again. Mitch says no became the rallying cry for FCC fans um, for a while. So uh, crazy that that's uh, that's her husband. But um, I guess he got hired a little bit earlier in February, and um, they became a package deal for the city of St. Louis. Man, so so you know. Uh, good good news for St. Louis. And then um, the other one, Zach, is Steven Zarzicki. Am I saying his name right? Good as guess as mine. Probably not. He knows Coach Beatty from Syracuse. Uh, he started out as volunteer assistant there in 2021. And then last season, he was an assistant at East Carolina. Graduated from Keene University in 2021, competing on their nationally ranked D3 team. Uh Men's soccer, John Klein was signed to, the ML, uh, to an MLS Next Pro contract by City, uh, where he will play for the second team now. Uh, Billikens won their spring game in Indianapolis 3-0 against Ohio State. The only directive I got on that game was we looked just okay. <laughs> uh, women's soccer, my guy Cal McKee uh, added to the staff as a volunteer assistant coach uh, he's going to continue to serve as Girls Academy Director for St. Louis Developmental Academy. Um, this is huge for him. He's going to um, he's going to get his feet wet in in college soccer. And uh, Cal McKee has done an amazing job uh, coaching girls soccer in the St. Louis area. Uh, I believe he was with Lou Fuse forever. Um, Scott Gallagher. Scott Gallagher. Sorry, Scott Gallagher. Yeah. Yes. Um, I thought Mo Rush, but I think that was just Chad Vandegrift. Um, he played at uh, Chaminade for uh, – he played at Chaminade with Slough assistant Kevin Stoll and then went to Santa Clara for three seasons before finishing at SLU. Uh Pete, any last thoughts before we get out of here? Just that I feel bad for a lot of these sports we do at the end when there's so much news, but I think they're probably all happy to cede a little time uh this week to uh women's basketball because yes. that's you know unprecedented stuff and i saw a lot of what um you know they were they were the other coaches were saying to women's basketball throughout the weekend it seemed like they, they were really um really pumped about that run and so um i bet everybody's just fine with us not covering them in super <laughs> long uh segments or with a lot of detail uh, because we went deep on women's basketball this week and deservingly so. I think it's interesting to see how our Olympic sports or I guess non-revenue sports, because I mean, women's basketball is technically a revenue sport, but uh, I guess it would be an Olympic sport, right? Basketball is an Olympic sport, technically. Um, sure. It's. I mean, I've always said that this team, like 
this team should be able to win easy mm. in any sport not named men's basketball. Like we should be able to put the we should be able to afford the the amount of uh, support that it takes to win at these levels. I I just see yeah. no reason why we can't consistently win the A10 championship, and uh, I yeah. think we're gonna win one here sooner rather than later in volleyball too. Yeah, um, I agree. Um, I do want to add one more women's basketball note to follow up on a question we had earlier. It is the top sixteen seeds who host for the first two rounds before Jesus. it goes to the two regional sites. Um, so yeah, so slew is going to be We're not going to get a home game in this one. No. <laughs> uh, and also no. it was, uh, it was Rancho Carne high school and in, in bring it on, which uh, translates to meat ranch, which is a, a hilarious, uh, name for a school <laughs> in a cheerleading movie. Oh yeah. Um, that's okay. Okay. We got it. We got yeah. there. We answered all of our questions. Yes, we did. Still need that other question answered, though, about the the number of. That's right. Uh, that wraps up the 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 amazing week in Billiken athletics. Uh, follow us on Twitter at Midtown Mad Pod. Uh, at Peter is a tweeter. At Zach Miller MMP. We're on Instagram at Midtown Mad Pod. Uh, if you have any suggestions, send them our way. Uh, don't forget to like and subscribe everywhere, anywhere. Leave a comment, five stars, all that jazz. Uh, thanks for listening, guys. As always, go Bills. Go Bills. We'll